Welcome to Weekend Agenda. I'm Samantha Maiden filling in for Jim Middleton. Joining me now live to discuss some of the issues that we've been canvassing earlier in the program is the Liberal Senator for Victoria, Jane Hume. Good afternoon, Jane. Hello, Sam. Good to be with you. Now, we've just been talking, uh, you may have heard earlier, about this announcement uh, that the Immigration Minister, Peter Dutton, has made uh, in relation to this threat of deportation for this large group of up to 30,000 asylum seekers that are still in Australia. This is the legacy caseload, as they're described, uh, from the Labor years. But they've been here a very long time. Uh, we were hearing there from the uh, human rights lawyer, George Newhouse, the government only allowed them to start applying uh, for asylum seeker status at the end of last year, and now this deadline uh, is looming. Do you think that that is uh, an issue of, of, of fairness, really, for these people if they are not having enough time to put their claims in? Well, Sam, you're absolutely right. This is the legacy caseload that is a hangover from the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd era, where 50,000 refugees came to Australia on more than 800 boats. There are still 7,500 people that are yet to make a legitimate claim for asylum. Uh, this uh, reform will see those 7,500 people required by the 1st of October to uh, substantiate their claim in order to receive Centrelink payments. Now, their access to health and to education services, that won't change. This is simply um, a restriction to Centrelink benefits paid for by the taxpayer if they can't substantiate their claim. But what are you going to do with these people? If you cut off their welfare, um, how do you actually expect them to survive? If, is the view that, uh, you know, if they just need to fend for themselves and get a job, uh, are you aware of whether there is any restrictions at all in terms of them working in the community if they don't actually have citizenship? Well, look, we're only talking about those refugees that have come here that aren't able to substantiate their claim, that are claiming Centrelink entitlements. And with any welfare entitlements, there is a mutual obligation. What we're asking them to do is substantiate their claim to genuine and make sure that they are genuine asylum seekers uh, in order to receive taxpayer money as welfare benefits. We're not taking away their health access. We're not taking away education for their children. This is uh, just determining that they are legitimate refugees. But it's not just uh, taking it away if they're not found to be genuine refugees. I mean, my understanding is it would be taking it away if they haven't lodged a claim. Is that correct? Well, in order to determine whether they are legitimate refugees, they have to lodge a claim. That's part of the mutual obligation. Mm. But would you be concerned as a legislator uh, and as a politician that these people would be, A, being descri uh, denied some sort of procedural fairness and, B, potentially exposing uh, Australia to legal claims by these asylum seekers where they would argue that the process uh, had been unfair to them, that they had not been able to have enough time to gather the evidence? If some of them have been here since 2013, why didn't the government allow them to uh, start applying for asylum seekers? back when the Abbott government was first elected? Well, they have been here since 2013 and we're now giving them four months to gather the evidence that they require and to uh, legitimise their claim to asylum before they receive any further Centrelink payments. And it's only Centrelink payments that we're dealing with here. And I think that, that it's uh, perfectly fair and reasonable for the taxpayer to expect that their funds are being used to fund welfare payments only for those who genuinely have a claim to asylum here in Australia. Would you be concerned, though, uh, about uh, any of these people being involved in crime uh, or if indeed they do have children being unable to uh, essentially house and feed them? I mean, I know you make the point that they'll be able to go to school and that they will be able to access um, some health services, but, uh, you know, often that costs money as well. I mean, are you concerned that these people could be left destitute uh, and that, you know, that they could turn to some sort of criminal activity uh, to actually be able to buy food and put a roof over their head? Well, I think that, you know, we might be getting ahead of ourselves there somewhat. Uh, Australia has one of the most generous refugee intake programs in the world and there are a number of services available to refugees. Uh, I think that, you know, the fact that we do provide a, a world-class education, world-class health services to asylum seekers is a credit 
to our country. But it is important that the mutual obligation um, is extended both ways uh, and that those asylum seekers return the favour to Australia by providing legitimate evidence, um, evidence of their legitimacy, that they are genuine asylum seekers. OK, let's turn now to this uh, debate over schools funding and Gonski uh, and some of the complaints of the Catholic sector. We heard uh, today from Christopher Pine, a former education minister uh, and a uh, Catholic uh, parent himself who sends his children to Catholic schools, that he has received uh, no complaints in his own electorate about this schools funding deal, uh, that some of the Jesuit schools in his state have written to parents saying that they always knew that this day would come when the funding would be realigned under a needs-based funding model, they won't be putting their fees up and there's essentially no complaint. And he actually accused a lobbyist for the Catholic school sector of blowing this debate up and making exaggerated claims. Now, what's uh, you, of course, have a, a lecturer that is as big as Victoria, uh, but this is absolutely the epicentre of where a lot of the complaints are coming from. The Catholic uh, Victorian Education Office rank run by Stephen Elder uh, is very much the leader in this entire campaign. What's your view of... What's happening in Victoria? Well, let me first say that I know Stephen and I have great respect for him. But I think it's important to take a step back and look at uh, the, these reforms as a whole. You know, these reforms, the Gonski 2.0 is the way they've been described, provides an extra $18.6 billion over the next decade on a genuine needs-based funding model and it is applied fairly across independent schools, across public schools and also across Catholic schools. In fact, the Catholic schools receive $3.4 billion of that 18.6 over the yes, next they, decade. They do, and they, and they get $80 billion, they get $80 billion over the next 10 years and, and there is a growth rate, I think, of 3.7 phasing, phasing down to uh, 3.5. But what is going on then with the claims that this uh, Catholic school sector is making? Now, you, you make the point that you know Stephen Elder. Uh, he's a very powerful man in Victoria. He's gotten successive governments, uh, including Dan Andrews, uh, to sign on to uh, very generous arrangements for Catholic schools. Uh, you know this man. You respect him. You also know that Catholic schools are getting more money. You've just outlined that in great detail. Why is Stephen Elder saying what he is about this deal? Well, I think that, you know, there is uh, an understanding that the Catholic education system, while it is receiving uh, a, a, a lesser uh, growth rate than the public sector, um, it, that's, become, that's because it's coming from a much higher base. Now, the Catholic education sector has a constituency to look after, um, as do we as, as legislators. And, you know, rightly so, it should be fighting for its constituents. However, I think when you take a step back... But should it be fighting with its constituents? Senator it's Hume, should it, be fighting, yes. should it be fighting for its constituents by using information that ministers say is a lie? Should they well, be fighting for their constituency by making claims that they're going to have to put up fees by thousands of dollars, which the Education Minister Simon Birmingham and the former Education Minister Christopher Pine say are falsehoods? I Should Stephen Elder be doing that? I think that parents of, of children that are in the Catholic system will now be able to see exactly what funding is dedicated to their children, to their schools, and they will see that there is significant growth in that funding. Uh, but that's not what the Catholic the Education Office of Victoria is telling those parents, and it's not what they're telling principals. They're telling that's principals exactly and right. parents that they need to be frightened because their fees are going to go up. Now, uh, is that true or is that well, a lie? I do find that slightly unscrupulous. Um, it is certainly an exaggeration. Uh, I think that parents will be able to see, we are providing a very transparent funding model, parents will be able to see that funding to their children, to their schools, is increasing quite significantly over time. And how the Catholic education system chooses, because they do retain uh, the distribution model um, within their own sector, uh, how the Catholic education system chooses to distribute funding in its own right is a matter for them. But parents will be able to see that their children, that their schools are getting more funding, significant funding, over the next decade. All right, Senator Hume, it was fantastic to talk to you uh, today. Thank you very much for your time on a Sunday. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam.